acceptable? And he said, sure, I can do that. Hmm, but can I do this? I think we need to order a new one of these. Would you advance the slide for me to the sermon section? Cool. Okay. Would you have the opening prayer at a culture festival? And he said, yeah, I can do that. And then they asked him, and could you do this dressed in Western costume? And he said, sure, yeah, why not? And they said, and could you have this opening prayer on horseback? And he said, okay, yeah, I can do that. And then they actually said, and could you have the opening prayer in a Native American loincloth? And uh, you can guess what he said. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> this is where I draw the line. I am not going to do that. It can be good to have boundaries, you know, where we know how far we're going to go and where we're not going to go. However, drawing the line can have more of a negative meaning when we talk about social boundaries and groups of other people, because we all ha tend to have people that we think of as our people. But if we have our people, then there are others who are not part of our group. And that can be make a difficulty for the gospel, really. It can be hard to talk to someone about Jesus or to say a hard word that needs to be said or even to be an outgrowing Christian among folks who think maybe you don't accept them as much as you accept other kinds of people. And you really can't have any influence on someone if you don't have any connection to them. So how does God want us to live toward people who are different from us? I think when you look at Jesus, you see someone who crossed all sorts of boundaries that other people had drawn. I mean, there were folks who thought, those folks are sinners, stay away from them, and Jesus spent time with them. Those folks are foreigners who aren't like us, stay away from them, and yet Jesus was spending time in Samaria and the Decapolis, among all sorts of people that really didn't feel as welcome among the regular people people that thought of themselves as God's people. Uh, those folks over there, they are unpatriotic, and they're even traitors to their country. They are, uh, they are taking up taxes for the Roman Empire. And yet Jesus also spent time with them. While he still as well stood very firm on this is what God says, and this is the truth, and this is sin, and this is not God's will. And yet, I'm going to talk with you. In fact, the only boundaries he seemed to draw were whether somebody was open to hearing about God's word and, and believing in what God said. And you can't know that about a person until you know that person. Today's story is a continuation of what happened in the early church in the book of Acts, especially for the sake of evangelism in a town called Antioch. I don't know. If, hey, I think I even have a... Woo! Okay. Antioch is right there. And Antioch at the time was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. They would take all the goods, imagine this, this map continues, out in Persia and India, and it would all flow over the desert highways to Antioch, and from there there was a port that it would go to the rest of the Roman world. And so it was a busy commercial hub, and the, you would find people from all sorts of cultures all over the world there that you'd rub shoulders with and come into contact with. And in this city, uh, world evangelism begins. Um, it's a cosmopolitan place. This, book, this city is huge in the book of Acts in terms of the history of the church and how the word of God would spread to the world. It's there that people are first called Christians, where folks are saying, hmm, what are we going to call these people who are following this Jesus Christ character? So you know they were rubbing, they were interacting with people who didn't know God and people who did know Jesus. This was the city where there was the first concerted evangelism effort in a whole city that didn't know God through Paul and Barnabas. This was the city 
from which St. Paul started each of his three missionary journeys across the Roman Empire because this was a city that would equip him and fund him and supply him and send him off so that other people would know about this Jesus that they had gotten to know even though they weren't Christians for very long themselves. So what was so special about Antioch that all of this happened there? I think it has to do with the willingness to cross social bounds and to interact with people not like us. The text says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. That's natural. These are people like us. We talk to them. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. It's natural for us to spend most of our time and to connect with and to live near and to buy houses around and to interact mostly with people who are a lot like us. There's something familiar about that. It's more comfortable. Uh, that's why the first Christians, who were all Jewish, shared Jesus mostly with, well, only with other Jewish Christians at first. Nothing wrong with that, so long as we don't stop there, because everybody needs to know Jesus. In Antioch, something different began to happen. In that great city, uh, people were far more likely to connect with uh, people of other cultures, people who were not like them, and to be genuine friends with them. And that's why in Antioch, the Christian faith makes this leap from a small group of Jewish people to a religion that would spread around the world. It was a very exciting thing. And when Jerusalem heard about it, they sent folks up there to check out what is going on in that city. And equally exciting for God, I think, is what can happen in a place like Owatonna. Because we need to ask ourselves always, what is God's purpose for me as an individual believer and for me as a body of believers in a church here where God has planted us so that the gospel will make that jump, not just from us, but to other people as well. I heard about a guy who lived in Minneapolis, and in his elevator, he kept seeing this guy who was from Nepal. He knew this because he started talking with him. But how do you make a connection with a guy who's so different from you, you know? And he knew there weren't many Christians in Nepal. So one day he said to him, say, I know you're, you're trying to learn our culture and language. Um, how about every time we see each other, I teach you another saying that we have, a, a proverb, you know, like... Um, a stitch in time staves nine, uh, look before you leap, and explain to you what it means. And he said, I would love that. And that started conversations with them on a regular basis, and, and it, it went in many different directions. And this guy could have just said, well, I'm going to be friendly and nod every time I see him in the elevator. But instead, he thought, what's God's purpose for me here where God has planted me in this world? In Antioch, God had opened several doors. God brought people to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene, which were of a different culture. And since Cyrene was in Africa, probably of a different race, ethnic group and race as well. And in this great multicultural city, they started to interact with others too. It was a great mix of people. And God is doing something, I think, in our city as well. If you start to think of the different kinds of people that you see here, that if you're a long-term resident, maybe you, you didn't used to see so much. Um, and what is our role? What's God trying to do in our life? I read that in the school system in Oatana, 5% of the students were born in another country. And 8% are, are struggling to learn English at the same time as they're learning their subjects. How do you connect with people like that? Well, think, what would it be like for you if you were one of only uh, a handful of a certain kind of group of people? How, how would you want people to interact with you? What would you want that to look like? 
A few years ago, Sarah was telling me about um, someone she, she met who was from Pakistan who came here to work in one of our industries. And she asked him how he was getting along here. And he said, you know what? I feel invisible. I feel like people just look past me and don't even see me when I'm around. How would you feel if that were you? Um, and, 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 and other people were interacting, but they weren't really connecting with you. What would you want someone to do? I've read that of the international students in our country, 80% of them say they do not have one Christian friend. And 70% will not do something so simple as have a normal American meal in an American home although they would dearly love to. Now, we don't have very many international college students in Oatana, but we do have people that are different from us all around us. I've read that 14% of the international students in our school system are from Asia, and you know how many Asian countries are closed to mission work. If you can interact with someone, you might not just have an effect on them, but on people in other countries as well. There, there are nations closed to mission work in Asia and in the Middle East and in Africa. I've read that Somalia is the third most dangerous country for a Christian missionary in the world after North Korea and Afghanistan. But look how many people from that country are right around us here. If we want to learn something from Antioch, I think it is that world evangelism is something that happens both out there and also right here as well because there are plenty of people around here that God wants to reach. And as I read this text of, of how it happened in that city, it largely depends on where folks draw the line in terms of who's in my group or who I'm going to interact with. And this difference can even be among people who are like us that we just don't know. I mean, imagine that someone walks into the church for the first time here, and they see lots of people. Maybe they're laughing. Maybe they're just talking. I mean, you can tell they're glad to see each other. But, you know, they don't join there because the, they don't know anybody. And it can ha we can feel like, what a friendly place. And maybe they have a different feeling because it's not quite the same for them. How do you interact with that person? The thing that surprises me, I think, most when I first read this text was that this great work of God didn't happen in Jerusalem. It happened in a place called Antioch, which is the first time that city, I think, is ever mentioned in the Bible. Uh, it's not part of the Old Testament, you know. It, it's, it's this kind of a new place. And, and Jerusalem seemed to have all the advantages I mean, the apostles were in Jerusalem. The eyewitnesses who had seen Jesus rise from the dead, you know, they, they, they had, that had all happened in Jerusalem. But this didn't happen in Jerusalem. No, it happened up in a, in a place where God was doing a new thing. Um, and it was a wonderful thing. Sorry, I lost my place. Sorry, all you watch it online. I know this is being recorded, but I got to find where I am again. Oh, yeah, I think it's here. Who is it? I mean, God does a new thing in every congregation and in every place. How does he want us to be more like Antioch? So as soon as the church in Jerusalem heard about this interesting thing that was happening up there, they sent Barnabas, who grabbed Paul, and they went to check it out. Now, of Barnabas, it says, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas was a godly man. He was a joy to be around. His real name was Joseph, but no one ever called him Joseph because uh, he got this nickname that kind of stuck, just like you probably know people who, you know them pretty well, but... You maybe even don't know their real name because everybody just calls them by something else. Well, this name he got, it means son of encouragement because that's the kind of person that he was. He was always building people up. He was generous. Uh, when there was um, a real lack in the church in Jerusalem, he sold some property, gave it to them. When St. Paul was first converted to Christianity and people were like, <laughs> don't trust him, 
uh, Barnabas could see the work of God in his life and took him under his arm and introduced him to all the apostles and to all the church in, in Jerusalem there. And everybody who's sitting here in church today is here, I think, because you've had a Barnabas in your life. You've had somebody that encouraged your faith along the way. And everybody who's sitting in the church today, I think, is here because also God wants you to be a Barnabas for somebody else. An encouragement in the faith to somebody who says, I'm so glad you helped me along at this time in my life. You can be an encouragement in words, but also in actions like Barnabas was. Because some, sometimes the most beautiful words are, how can I help you right now? And Barnabas, he's just that kind of a person. Of course, he's not perfect. One time he and St. Paul got into such, a, such an argument that they said, I can't even be around you right now. And they went in different paths uh, in mission work apart from each other for a while. And Paul, he wasn't perfect either. I mean, he had been a rabid anti-Christian who wanted to see them all in prison if, they, if he could. And on one of those journeys to, to round up more Christians for prison, Jesus got a hold of him. Uh, like a bright light knocked him off his horse and Jesus talked to him, and the scales fell from his eyes, and he could see how blind he had been. And God said, you're going to be my witness to the world. Barnabas and Paul. And he was. He suffered much for it. All of us here have seen the light of who God is for us. We have seen Jesus, our Savior, who forgives us and calls us to faith in him and calls us to live God's way and to be an influence in the world through whom God will work. We know that. If we didn't know Jesus, we'd be in the dark about who we were. Some years ago, I performed a wedding, uh, and it, there was a huge storm during the wedding, and uh, the power went out. And the farmers all went home and got their generators. And they brought them to the reception so that they could power up the needed things there. Uh, but there were still some very dark areas in, that, uh, in the reception hall, especially where the food line was. And uh, one of the old farmers said, I never before in my life ate a meal where I had a full plate, but I didn't know what I was on my fork until I put it in my mouth. That, that's quite a memory. Another woman told me, I tried very hard to rotate my plate so that everything was in a good spot, but when I got back to where I was going to eat, I found that I had put my sauerkraut right on my jello, and that was not a good taste combination. When St. Paul saw the light on that Damascus road, he heard a voice say, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And God, I think, he enlightens our life when we see that Jesus was persecuted for us. We see him beaten. We see him heading to the cross. We see him taking our sins. We see him saying, you are forgiven and a child of God. Remain in me. Follow me. Live by the word of God. And I have something in mind for you. Then the scales fall from our eyes. And we see what our life was meant to be here for. St. Paul didn't say, I messed up so bad God could never use me. He heard the words instead that you heard from this lectern just a moment ago where Jesus said, I have appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. God appointed you. That means like before you were born, he had something in mind that he was going to accomplish through you. And Barnabas, Barnabas didn't say, well, I'm uneducated. I'm, I'm not that gifted. I'm not that, uh, there's nothing special about me. He heard the words that you heard from that lectern where Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And he said, well, I can do that after all that Jesus did for me. And he got so good at it that that's what he became known for, a son of encouragement. Today, we're called to be that sort of person in this world, a son of encouragement. And as happened in Antioch, to expand the family of God to all kinds of people that God wants to reach. Amen.